Symposium by Plato. Diotima questions Socrates. Now I'll let you go. I shall try to go through for you the speech about love I once heard for a woman of Manitina, a Diotima, a woman who is wise about many things besides this. Once she even put off the plague for ten years by telling the Athenians what sacrifices to make. She is the one who taught me the art of love, and I shall go through her speech as best I can on my own, using what Agathon and I have agreed to as a basis. Following your lead, Agathon, one should first describe who love is and what he is like, and afterwards describe his works. I think it will be easiest for me to proceed the way Diotima did and tell you how she questioned me. You see, I told her almost all the same things Agathon told me just now, that love is a great god and that he belongs to beautiful things. And she used the very same arguments against me that I used against Agathon. She showed how, according to my very own speech, love is neither beautiful nor good. <clears throat> so I said, what do you mean, Diotima? Is love ugly then and bad? But she said, watch your tongue. Do you really think that if a thing is not beautiful, it has to be ugly? I certainly do. If a thing is not wise, it's ignorant. Or haven't you found out yet that there's something in between wisdom and ignorance? What's that? It's judging things correctly without being able to give a reason. Surely you see that this is not the same as knowing, for how can knowledge be unreasoning? It's not ignorance either, for how could what hits the truth be ignorance? Correct judgment, of course, has this character. It is in between understanding and ignorance. True, said I, as you say. Then don't force whatever is not beautiful to be ugly, or whatever is not good to be bad. It's the same with love. When you agree he is neither good nor beautiful, you need not think he is ugly or bad. It could be something in between, she said. Yet everyone agrees he is a great god, I said. Only those who don't know, she said. Is that how you mean everyone? Or do you include those who do know? Oh, everyone together. And she laughed. <clears throat> Socrates, how could those who say that he's not a god at all agree with it, that he's a great god? Who says that, I asked. You for one, she said, and I for another. How can you say this, I exclaimed. That's easy, said she. Tell me, wouldn't you say that all gods are beautiful and happy? Surely you'd never say God is not beautiful or happy. Zeus, not I, I said. Well, by calling anyone happy, don't you mean they possess good and beautiful things? Certainly. What about love? You agreed he needs good and beautiful things, and that's why he desires them, because he needs them. I certainly did. Then how could he be a god if he has no share in good and beautiful things? There's no way he could, apparently. Now do you see? You don't believe love is a god either. Then what can love be, I asked. A mortal? Certainly not. Then what is he? He's like what we mentioned before, he said. He is in between mortal and immortal. What do you mean, Diotima? He is a great spirit, Socrates. Everything spiritually you see is in between God and mortal. What is their function, I asked. They are messengers who shuttle back and forth between the two, conveying prayer and sacrifice from men to gods, while the men they bring commands from the gods and gifts in return for sacrifices. Being in the middle of the two, they round out the whole and bind fast the all to all. Through them all, divination passes through them the art of priests and sacrifice and ritual, enchantment, prophecy, and sorcery. Gods do not mix with men. They mingle and converse with us through spirits instead, whether we are awake or asleep. He who is wise in any of these ways is a man of spirit, but he who is wise in any other ways, profession or any manual work, is merely mechanic. These spirits are many and various, then, and one of them is love. Who are his father and mother? asked. <clears throat> That's rather long story, she said. I'll tell it to you, all the same. 